Hello everyone, welcome back to our channel. Earlier, we shared discussions on time from Elizabeth April and Dolores Cannon. Today, we will share Daryl Anka's discussion on time. Daryl Anka is a best-selling author, channeler, and filmmaker. Daryl has showcased his creative talent in writing, directing, and producing films through his production company Zia Films. He joined the film industry in 1977, and his first film was, Star Trek, for which he and his team created all the props. In 1973, after witnessing two UFO sightings over Los Angeles, Daryl began exploring various metaphysical topics. In 1983, he was introduced to attend a workshop where, during meditation, a memory was unlocked in him, describing it as someone inserting a DVD into his mind. In this memory, he realized that he had signed an agreement long ago to transmit messages from an entity named Bashar in this lifetime. At the same time, the workshop facilitator suddenly told him that there was an entity present waiting to communicate with him, and another participant drew an image identical to Bashar in Daryl's mind. Because of this double validation, Daryl began to accept it and has been in contact ever since. He refers to this as channeling and has said that no one has to believe Bashar is real, it could be another aspect of his own consciousness or personality. But he must present it as it originally came through. The key is whether you believe Bashar is real or not. You can actually test the formulas, messages, and information he shares about life and get real results. For 40 years, individuals from all over the world have come to experience Daryl Anka's channeling. Daryl says Bashar's world is called Essasani, they are hybrids of greys and humans. From a genetic perspective, humans could be considered their ancestors, which is why they are helping us. However, they are highly evolved, communicating through telepathy but named Bashar to aid our understanding. They are cautious to prevent a scenario like Earth's grey version's destruction. Bashar describes death as waking from a dream, realizing your true self. Essentially, when you die, it's like waking from a dream, discovering your true self because you're already there, just pretending not to be. A part of your soul is dreaming this physical reality. He uses a TV analogy to explain parallel realities. Just as you watch one channel while others play simultaneously, we experience billions of parallel realities each second. Each reality is created by us every second. According to him, physical reality is a projection of consciousness. We never leave the spiritual realm, it's our natural state. We constantly project billions of times per second, creating the experience of physical reality. We're essentially new every second, billions of times. When you are truly able to focus on the fact that you are new every moment, you can define yourself as you wish because you always return to zero. Whatever you define yourself as in the next moment is your reality, including thoughts of the past and future. Changing your present actually changes your past because, now, is everything, past thoughts are just another, now, you've moved out of, but they still continue, like a TV show playing when you change channels. He says the structure of existence never changes, what changes is our relationship with it, our perspective on it, our experience of it. This is how creation expands because the structure never changes, it is what it is. So are we those timelines, those parallel realities? Do they influence each other? Actually, from Bashar's perspective, those parallel realities always influence each other. What we think of as one timeline can actually be made up of thousands of timelines, so it depends on which frame you want to jump to. In the next moment, when you make a decision, that decision might be more favorable for another timeline, so if you make that decision, you're actually jumping timelines, but you think it's the same timeline, so you're constantly changing your present. This means you're constantly changing your past because that present, that timeline, has a different past. So you might not know what your past was five minutes ago, you think you know what it was, but that's the past you have to remember now, and it automatically looks like it's always been that way. For some reason. Sometimes there are penetrations, and deja vu is one of them. I've done this before, 
feeling like I've been here before because you might be touching a parallel reality, or you might have already planned it on a spiritual level, and now it looks familiar because you remember you planned it, or you're connected to a parallel reality where another you has already done this, so it feels like I've done this before, even though I haven't actually. So in many different ways, there are penetrations between parallel realities, between material and non-material realities, and they can create some mysterious things, like deja vu, and things like telepathy, because what you're doing is just touching countless coexisting probabilities. All these possibilities exist simultaneously, and telepaths aren't actually predicting the future, they're perceiving the energy that exists when making predictions. They perceive the possible paths that energy might take you if you don't change it. So if you don't like where it says you're going, sometimes a prediction might actually become outdated, so it's not that the prediction was wrong, but you changed it by knowing it. We don't always stay on one timeline, we constantly jump timelines. Acceleration isn't because we're moving faster, as we're already moving billions of times per second, which is very fast. He says it's more about the frames you want to go to, making it seem like you're skipping frames. So maybe it's no longer the process of going through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, maybe you've made some changes, changed what you need to experience. Now you go from 1 to 5, 5 to 10, instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so you might skip frames meaning you seem to be accelerating because there are fewer continuities between frames. It's no longer a smooth transition, things change quickly because you're skipping intermediate frames, but you're still moving at the same rate. There are timelines that represent higher frequencies, there are more positive timelines, and there are more negative timelines. Positive ones usually have connectivity, collective expansion, so they generally represent higher frequencies, Negative ones are usually more detached, experiencing reduction, which means they're usually lower frequencies. In general, because it's no longer connected, it's disassociated, which is lower frequency, so yes, there are higher and lower frequency timelines. That's why he gives us the so-called formula because he basically says the formula is a navigation tool. By following the formula, you're navigating yourself towards higher frequency timelines, so you're more moving in that direction. So what is this formula? This is a very simple five-step formula. First, follow your passion, which is the true core of your vibration, as Bashar calls it, is crucial. Because from his perspective, we have a material mind, and we have a non-material higher mind, which is still a part of our consciousness. In theory, when we allow it to be our guiding system, both work together, so he says the higher mind communicates with the material mind in energy language. Our material body and material mind translate these energy messages from our higher mind into physical sensations we call passion, love, excitement, curiosity, or attraction. So when we are willing to take action according to the passion presented to us, when we suddenly find ourselves passionate about something, Taking action on it is a way of responding to the higher mind, saying I hear you, I hear you telling me the reason this excites me is because this is me, this is my path, this is my vibration. Because according to Bashar, while the higher mind communicates with energy information, the language of the physical mind is action, not words, we are in a physical reality, you need to take physical action to make things happen. So when you are willing to take action to follow the passion guided by the higher mind, we are responding and creating a dialogue, and then this dialogue can continue. If we don't take action to follow the passion, the higher mind won't send us any other opportunities until we take the action it has already given us. So taking action on your passion forms a strong connection to our higher mind, or a strong awareness of our connection to the higher mind, and enables us to receive guidance and take action, leading us to the true path. Second, act as best as possible until we can no longer act. Therefore, you explore every path, every opportunity to do what excites you until you simply can't find another way to do it. This means that at that moment, other actions need to be taken. Perhaps it looks unrelated to what you have done before. But if it's your highest excitement at the moment, it's a clue to your passion that you're following, telling you it's connected, like you might be making a movie. Suddenly something appears to be a barrier, 
and you can't get from A to Z anymore. So you look around, and you say, well, what can I do? Of all the things I can choose to do today, what excites me a little more than any other choice? Well, I want to take a walk on the beach. So, what does that have to do with making a movie? I don't know. But I'm going to do it. When you're walking on the beach, synchronicities happen, you hear a conversation between two people. That's the answer you're looking for to move forward in making the movie. That's how it works. Everything is interconnected. But when you follow your passion, synchronicity makes it evidence. So the third thing is to take action. For most people, this is difficult. You have to act according to your passion, do your best, and absolutely do not stick to or assume what you think the result should be. Because the fact is, we have no idea what the best result should actually be. Sometimes we may guess, but we don't really know. So by letting go of expectations and insisting on what the result should look like, we allow the higher mind and synchronicity to bring us the results that are actually best for our true purpose and existence. The next point is that, whatever happens, even things we technically dislike, things that are incompatible with our vibration, things that feel wrong to us. We must remain positive. Because we must know that something happened for a reason. And by staying positive, we can actually benefit from the things we don't like happening in our lives. So, a simple example is that something we don't like might come up. Even just to more clearly teach us the difference between what we don't like and what we do like, this is a desirable way to use what you don't like. If it's for a reason, how could I possibly get clearer by contrast, how can I more clearly see where I don't like things, more clearly understand the path you're on, to move more toward what I do like? It clarifies your thinking, clarifies your understanding of the path you're on, sometimes seeing things in contrast. The fifth and final thing is that you must change your beliefs. You must let go of all negative beliefs based on fear, hindering you from becoming your negative self, you know, I'm afraid I might fail, I'm not good enough, people will think I'm crazy. All of these things must be cleared from you. So this mechanism, this formula can work more effectively within you. When you do all of these things, when you take those steps, and apply them as accurately and cleanly as possible. The synchronicities in your life become absolutely crazy, miraculous to the point of almost unbelievable. Your life becomes a carnival of synchronicities one after another, so much so that you can tell people stories, and they hardly believe you because it looks too good to be true, almost unbelievable. Too magical, too strange, too crazy. There's a perfect example. When Daryl was making the documentary First Contact, they were looking for a narrator, and they eventually found another one, but the one they really wanted initially was a particularly famous actor, and he said we won't mention his name. We just said, how can we contact this actor? Well, we'll send a letter to his agent, and we found his agent and sent a letter. The next day. Our friend wanted to have lunch together, he recommended a restaurant I had never been to before. But we said okay, we'll go there. I walk in the door. And who walks out at the door, it's the actor. I said hey, we just sent a letter to your agent. He said, well, okay, I'll take a look. But the fact is, in a city with millions of people, in a restaurant I've never been to before, unless my friend recommended it, I would never go there. This actor, we just sent him a letter the day before, was standing right in front of me, and I had the opportunity to discuss this possibility with him. These are things that happen frequently. When you apply this formula to your life. It's like everything starts to arrange itself automatically. Everything tells you it's interconnected, we're not really isolated. So it's an incredibly amazing experience.